So I felt like I was living in a sunless garden where the flowers were all dead. I remember seeing these people laugh and I thought, what's there to be happy about? It's kind of like I was looking at the world through dark glasses and there seemed to be no light at the end of the tunnel. Back in the summer of 2002, I went through a severe depression. And I still remember um, going to the General's Hospital, which is the psychiatry department of Mayo Clinic. And I remember how ashamed I was. I remember sitting there thinking, gosh, I hope no one sees me. I mean, I'm a pastor. We're not supposed to have any problems. And guys, uh, to be honest with you, if I could have wore a face mask that day, I would have done it because I was embarrassed to have people see me being seen for my mental health. Now, that was back in 2002, and my attitude back then shows that I had a stigma towards mental illness. And today I want to ask you the question, do you have a stigma when it comes to mental illness? Now, before we talk about the stigma, let's first talk about what mental illness is. And by the way, I was driving around Casson yesterday, and I saw this sign, and it reminded me that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. But what is mental illness? According to NAMI, it says mental illness, now watch this, is a medical condition that disrupts a person's thinking, feeling, mood, ability to relate to others, and daily functioning. Just as diabetes is a disorder of the pancreas, mental illnesses are medical conditions that often result in a diminished capacity for coping with the ordinary demands of life. So think for a moment about your brain. It's about the size of two fists. It weighs about three pounds. It has over one billion nerve cells or neurons. Each neuron can transmit 1,000 messages a second. These messages travel at 268 miles per hour. Your brain consumes 20% of the calories that you intake daily. Your brain consumes 20% of the oxygen you breathe in. Your brain generates about 50,000 thoughts per day. There's about 2,500,000 gigabytes of storage space in your brain. One person said that your brain is like having 100 billion computers inside your own skull. Amit Sood of the Mayo Clinic says, imagine a giant Christmas light as large as a shopping mall made of an estimated 85 billion light bulbs all connected by crisscrossing wires. Each wire touches thousands of others, creating 100 trillion touch points. Now shrink that light to the size and shape of a cantaloupe, and you have our brain. Now here's what I want you to think about. Why do we look on people who have a heart illness, and the heart is a much simpler organ than the brain, with compassion, And we often look with judgment and stigma and shame on those that have a brain illness. Pastor Rick Warren, best-selling author of The Purpose Driven Life, his son wrestled with mental illness and eventually ended up committing suicide. And he wrote an article on mental illness and he said, it's not a sin to be sick. He said, if your liver stops working and you take a pill, there's no stigma. If your heart stops working and you take a pill, there's no stigma then why is it that if your brain stops working and you take a pill, there's a stigma? Now, there are different kinds of mental illness. For example, there are anxiety disorders. There's attention deficit disorder or hyperactivity disorder. There's autism spectrum disorder. There's eating disorders. There's mood disorders like bipolar or depression. There's personality disorders. And then there's schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. And I just want to say to you today that if you are wrestling with a mental illness, you are not alone. It's been estimated that about 25% of the population wrestles with a mental illness. And according to Amy Simpson, the amount of people that wrestle with a mental illness is equivalent to the amount of people that are diagnosed each year with cancer, that are living with diabetes, are living with heart illness, 
heart disease and HIV and AIDS combined. Now, why do I say all of that? I say all of that to say this, that all of us are touched by mental illness some way. Whether you're struggling with it, a family member, a coworker, a boss, a classmate, it is that prevalent. So we've talked about what mental illness is. We've talked about how common it is. Now, what does it mean when we say that people have a stigma towards mental illness? Well, stigma means a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. Let me read that again. A mark of disgrace often associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. In other words, we can look down on people who wrestle with a mental illness. Well, you're just lazy. You're, you know, what's wrong with you? Shame on you. You know, uh, one of our leaders of our Rejoice and Resilience ministry talks about doing a, a brainstorming session with her group. And she asked the people, what comes to the general population's mind when they think about someone struggling with cancer? And they came up with words like champion and overcomer. She then asked the question, what comes to people's mind when they think about someone struggling with a mental illness? Lunatic? Crazy? Weak? Wacko? Do you see how often we stigmatize people who wrestle with a mental illness? In the book Living Grace, it says, in the general public, persons with mental health difficulties are often thought to be addicts, lazy, or faking. In the church, mental health problems are often spiritualized and thought to be the result of a lack of faith or personal sin. Research shows that, now watch this, 30 to 40% of individuals with a mental, mental health disorder who approach their church are often told there's no such thing. Now guys, this sense of stigma is not a little thing. It is the major barrier that keeps people from becoming healthy in this area. In fact, according to the U.S. Surgeon General years ago, it says the stigma is the most formidable obstacle to the future progress in the arena of mental illness and health. Why would you want to get help? Why would you want to get help if you're just going to be labeled crazy or shame on you or you're a disgrace? This stigma, this wrong stigma, is the major barrier to people getting help often. Now, listen to what Nami says. Stigma erodes confidence that mental disorders are real, treatable health conditions. Circle that word health. We've allowed stigma and now an unwarranted sense of hopelessness to erect attitudinal, structural, and financial barriers to effective treatment and recovery. Now, watch this. It's time to take these barriers down. Now, at Community Celebration Church, one of our goals is to stop the stigma. In fact, we have a vision statement that we often read, and in that vision statement, we say that we dream of being a church where there is no stigma when it comes to mental illness because people see it as a medical issue, not a moral one. And you know, one of the best ways that we can break the stigma is to simply talk about it. You know, there's a survey done, and they found out that only 12% of church leaders said that mental illness is talked about openly in their church. Only 12% of churches, mental illness is talked about openly in that church. So when it comes to mental illness, do you have a no-speak rule? Whether you're struggling with it or a family member, well, we just don't talk about it. We just sweep it under the rug. Guys, that attitude only reinforces the stigma. And that is why we're doing this series, Stigma Free at CCC, Mental Illness and the Church's Compassionate Response. Now, one of the things that helped me overcome my stigma was realizing that many of the people I looked up to wrestled with a mental illness. For example, Martin Luther, who penned A Mighty Fortress is Our God, said, for more than a week, I was close to the gates of death and hell. I trembled in all my members, and Christ was wholly lost to me. Now, Martin Luther's biographer said that he was subject to recurrent periods of exaltation and depression of spirit. That was the great Martin Luther. Another guy I looked up to was Charles Spurgeon. 
And Charles Spurgeon, in a, in a pastor's world, is often considered the prince of pastors. I mean, he's the guy. But did you know that he wrestled with depression so bad that he was gone from the pulpit about two or three months a year? He said, I am the subject, he said to his congregation in 1866, I am the subject of depression of spirit so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such an extreme of wretchedness as I'm going through. What about Mother Teresa? You know, Mother Teresa was one of the most respected people in the world. She won the Nobel Peace Prize, taking care of those sick and dying children. In 2007, some of her journals and letters were published. And what we found is that she wrestled with significant depression her whole life. She said in one of those letters, there is such terrible darkness within me as if everything was dead. It has been like this more or less from the time I started the work. I found a list of some contemporary people who wrestle with mental illness. Pop singer Lady Gaga, bipolar disorder. Kevin Love, he used to play for the Timberwolves. Anxiety and depression, one time he had to leave a game because he had a panic attack. Emerson Griffin, Minnesota Vikings. Pop singer Selena Gomez, depression. Pop singer Mariah Carey, bipolar disorder. Comedian and actor Jim Carey, depression. Comedian and pastor Steve Larson, anxiety, depression. I was hoping you got that, but um, so um, anyways, actor and Brad Pitt, depression. Actress Carrie Fisher, who played Princess Leia in Star Wars, bipolar. Actor Mel Gibson, bipolar. The most decorated Olympian in history, Michael Phelps, depression. Serena Williams, the tennis champion, depression. The late actor Robin Williams, bipolar disorder. Four-time Super Bowl winning quarterback, Terry Bradshaw, depression. If you wrestle with a mental illness, I just want to let you know you're in good company. You're in a group of very intelligent, talented, creative people, and you have nothing to be ashamed of. So how do we as a church respond to mental illness? Well, I think we respond the way Jesus would respond, right? I mean, that's our goal, is to become like Christ in our thoughts and our character and our action. And the question becomes is how does Jesus respond to ill people? In Matthew chapter 14, verse 14, it says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had what? Compassion on them and healed their sick. When Jesus saw needy people, he didn't shame them. He didn't disgrace them. He didn't put a stigma on them. The Bible says that he was moved with compassion. Now that word compassion literally means that his inner being was stirred to action. Did you know in the Gospels, it talks about 12 times compassion and eight of those references are to Christ himself. In other words, when Jesus saw ill people, he was moved with compassion. He didn't see them with a stigma. He saw them with compassion. Now watch this. If Jesus is compassionate towards ill people and if spiritual growth is becoming like Jesus, then doesn't it make sense that we know we're growing spiritually when we start acting like him and we start having compassion towards those who are ill, whether they're mentally ill or physically ill? Let me say it again. It's so important. If spiritual growth is becoming like Jesus and if Jesus is compassionate towards ill people, then we know we're growing spiritually when we begin to see people the way Jesus saw people. Jesus saw ill people, whether they're physically or mentally ill, with compassion. So how do we get rid of the stigma? You know, I remember playing a game of tag, and if you played this game and you tag someone, they're out. And I want to give you just three simple suggestions on how to tag the stigma so it's cast out. And I put these, these uh, steps in an easy-to-remember acronym, TAG, T-A-G. And the first step is to talk to God. And maybe today you're out there and you're like, I have a stigma. I have a stigma towards those that are mess wrestling with a mental illness. Guys, just own it. Talk to God. Say, Lord, forgive me. Say, Lord, 
Forgive me for not seeing others the way you see them with compassion. Lord God, remove the judgment, remove the stigma, and place in me what's in you, compassion. See, that's what prayer is about. Prayer is about being connected to the Lord. And as you're connected to him, he flows in us what's in him. And the more you're connected with the Lord, the more he'll flow that compassion in you towards ill people. But just talk to the Lord. Just say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, please remove this stigma that I have. The A is to ask questions. If you know someone who's wrestling with a mental illness, don't avoid them. You know, one of the most loving things you can do for another person is just listen to them. Ask them, what's it like to be in your shoes? And don't try to fix them. Don't try to give them a bunch of advice. Just listen to them in an understanding, non-judgmental way. Now, once they share it with you, don't avoid them. You want to avoid someone who has a physical illness, so why would you avoid someone that has a mental illness? Guys, here's another thing. Get educated. You know, a lot of the stigma comes from the fact that uh, we just have wrong knowledge. I want to encourage you to um, get educated in this area. Now, on our website, we actually have a box called Stigma Free at CCC. And in that website, there are some links that you can go to to become educated when it comes to mental illness. Also, in the description of this service, there are some links you can go, go to to get educated. So how do we tag out the stigma. We talk to God. We're honest. We say, Lord, hey, I'm falling short here. I, I have a stigma. We ask questions. We become educated. And then finally, we get help. <laughs> Do you know what would make my day? Is that if I heard that someone out there who had been suffering in silence for years, well, I don't want to get help. I don't want to be labeled weak. I don't want to be labeled lunatic. I don't want to be... Just make my day if I found out that someone, the Holy Spirit, just, just whispered in their ears, get help. And they were to take that courageous step to get help. You know, often the uh, first place to start is to go see your primary medical doctor and just tell them what's going on within you. And see, here's the good news if you get help. According to NAMI, it says this, the best treatment for serious mental illness today are highly effective. Watch this, between 70 and 90% of individuals have a significant reduction of symptoms and improved quality of life with a, a combination of pharmacological and psychosocial treatments and support. Do you know what that's saying? There's hope. I mean, some of you have been under that dark cloud for so long that your eyes have adjusted to it and, and that's your normal. But I'm just believing that for some of us as we go and get help, those energizing rays are going to start bursting forth through those dark clouds. I'm just believing that those, the sun is going to invade that garden again. I'm just believing that some of us are going to just kind of walk out of black and white and see color again by the grace and the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's my question to you today. Would you join me in stopping the stigma? Would you join me in stopping the stigma by seeing people the way Jesus did with compassion? Would you tag the stigma so it's out of here? Would you talk to God? Would you ask questions? And would you get help? You know, I believe that one of the biggest ways that we can overcome the stigma is simply talking about it. And with that in mind, I want you to check out this video of Pastor Rachel. Hey everyone, my name is Rachel and you might know me as the energetic, fun, crazy person who does the kids part of the sermons on Sundays. And that's how a lot of people know me, as a positive, energy-filled, um, fun person who loves God and kids. And for that reason, a lot of people are surprised when they learn that I deal with mental illness. For a long time, I have struggled with seasonal depression. 
And for me, some of the symptoms look like a loss of motivation, isolation, and this unending negative thinking about my situations and mostly myself. And so with all of those things, before I had seen a counselor, my brain had always just made me out to be this inherently lazy, complainer, negative person. And so my brain would take these things that I was experiencing and actually use them to go further down this cycle of negativity. And the main reason why I would feel this isolation is because I would never talk about it. I didn't want people to think that I was annoying or a complainer or super negative, and so I just wouldn't say anything at all. And for the most part, people had no idea that I was dealing with anything because I could work up some energy and put on a positive face and seem completely normal. But you can only live that way for so long. And when I moved to college and started living in this really close community, my roommates and the people around me noticed that later in the semester I had become really closed off, which was very different from the Rachel that had started out the semester. So I decided to finally start seeing a counselor. And that's one thing that I absolutely love about our church's vision statement. It talks about imagine a church where people see mental illness as a medical issue and not a spiritual one. And that lesson was so important for me because my first breakthrough happened in counseling. My counselor would ask me to write down my thoughts when I was feeling negative. And we would see how these things that started as a situation or a fact very quickly spiraled into lies. For example, we would take something like, um, it would start with, it's so cold outside, there's so much snow on my car, it must take so much work to get all of that off, there's really no point in going anywhere or doing anything at all, I'm so lazy for thinking that, I'm such a complainer, my friends must be so annoyed with me, etc., etc. And so she t showed me how to take that and reverse it back to the fact and write a new narrative. It's so cold outside, and it might not be worth going anywhere, but I wonder what we could do inside instead. I wonder what my friends are up to. I'm so thankful that I have people in my life that I love to do things with and all of these experiences I enjoy, etc., etc. So I learned that mental health is a medical issue with medical solutions, whether that's cognitive behavioral therapy or medication. But the spiritual aspect comes in because there are some times where I'm not strong enough to fight things in my own power. And my second breakthrough came a few years after I had started seeing this counselor. And after I had been managing really well for a while, I kind of came to this place where things started to feel really intense again. And I felt like the negative thoughts that were coming at me, like I was powerless to fight them off. Almost like they owned my mind. And I had always been good about staying consistent in a really special day where I came across this passage that changed me. And I want to read it for you today. It's Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. And it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And when I read that, something just clicked. It clicked in me that that's what I had known and been trying to do this whole time, was just to think about what was 
true and pure and noble and right. And so I would read this passage out loud several times a day in my room and every single night before I went to bed for a good period of time and the words started to become ingrained on my heart. And I would find that as I was having these moments of negative thinking, this thought would come into my mind of, Rachel, is that thought true? Is that right? Is that lovely? And as I would answer no, then these thoughts would flood my mind of, well, what is true? It's true that I am loved. It's true that I am perfectly and wonderfully made. And it's true that God is for me. And it was like there was this power that was greater than my own that was protecting my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. So does that mean that I no longer struggle with seasonal depression? No. In fact, one of the reasons that I was so excited to get a job in California was I thought that I would no longer struggle with anything at all. But instead, I ended up dealing with new issues, with panic attacks, a bout of paranoia, and with anxiety. You can't run from your problems, but you can admit that they are there, get help, and run to God. I wanted to just thank Rachel for her courage of sharing. Would you join me and just thank you? That's how the stigma is broke, is people just sharing their story. And I just want to pray for you today. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit would, you know, make this a safe place for people who wrestle with any kind of illness, whether that's physical or mental or spiritual. Would you just pray with me? Lord, I pray that you would help us to see ill people the way you do. Take out the judgment, the stigma. Fill us with compassion and understanding. Lord, I pray for anyone who is mentally ill today, that you would just do something in their hearts so that they would quit suffering in silence and seek the help they need. Guide them and direct them. I pray for those that have a friend or a family member who wrestle with mental illness. Be there for them as well. Lord, I pray that Community Celebration Church would just be a safe place for people to be in process and a place where everyone realizes they are in process. None of us have arrived. Lord, we just come to you today and ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with that compassion to see people the way you do. We love you, Jesus. We ask this in your name. And everyone said, Amen.